Hello, and welcome back to Spectacular Specimens. I'm Dr. Katherine O'Brien. Each week we present a new set of specimens from the Museum of Biological Diversity with help from my friends and colleagues at the Museum of Biological Diversity and the Grandview Heights Public Library. This week we will be talking about mighty mosses. Mosses were the first plants to make it onto land and are still the plant world's ultimate survivors. After this video, if you want to learn more about mosses, check out the books listed from the Grandview Heights Public Library in the description below. Right now, let's explore the many mosses of Ohio. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Clips. I'm a botanist with the Museum of Biological Diversity, and I'm particularly interested in mosses. I like mosses, well, partly because they're small, but they have a lot of detail, which means that in order to look at them really well, you get to use microscopes, which are some of my favorite things, and I'm going to show you uh, what, what we can see through microscopes very soon. I also like them because they, they're tough little plants. They can grow places where nothing else can grow, and also you don't have to travel very far to see them. There are almost 400 species of mosses just here in Ohio, and so I'm going to show you that you don't have to travel very far at all to see a moss. Let's go look at one right now. Ooh, nice day. Oh, I love this sweet gum tree. So here we have a little brick wall. What an inhospitable place for plant life. A bare, basically rock surface. But, if you look carefully, it's covered in green. This moss is growing here. What I'm going to do is scrape off a piece of it with my pocket knife and we'll look at it under the microscope. So here's this moss through the dissecting microscope and you can see it has a circle of leaves that are in like a little flower-like rosette and these granular bodies on the upper surface of the leaves, those are called gemmy. They're asexual reproductive structures that can break off and form entire new plants. Let's look through the compound scope and here we can see an entire leaf and it's flat, you can see the leaf cells, and you can see the gemmy and a nice strong mid-vein of the leaf. Here's a close-up photo that was taken in the rain a couple of years ago, and it, it illustrates an important point about mosses. They're what are called non-vascular plants, and that means they don't have any tissues within their bodies to carry food and water around, so they have to adjust to whatever moisture is available. So here's that same moss when it's dry. It's all curled up, looks kind of dead, but it's not. Mosses are what's called poikilohydric. That means that with respect to water, they're like what snakes and other reptiles are with respect to temperature. Whatever the environmental levels are, that's the levels they're at. They can't bring water into their bodies because they don't have that vascular tissue, that plumbing that, some, that most other plants do. And so they're able to just um, dry up and persist until it gets damp again. Mosses, therefore, can grow in these really, really inhospitable environments. They're really tough. Another important aspect of moss biology is how they reproduce and these stages of the life cycle that are called the gametophyte and the sporophyte. So there's actually two mosses in this picture. The one we've already met, the one that looks like a flower kind of with the granular gemmy reproducing only asexually. That leafy stage of the life cycle is called the gametophyte. Normally, it produces gametes, eggs and sperm, but that particular moss never does. It's kind of strange that way. But the other moss, the one with the leaves that are narrow and don't have the gemmy on top, it also has these structures that are, well, they look sort of like shaped like cans, and they have sort of like a sunburst of um, teeth around the top. That structure is called a sporangium, and it's a case that contains spores. Spores are individual cells. They're tiny. They can blow far and wide. And it's actually a different phase of the life cycle that produces the spores. It's called the sporophyte. So when we look at mosses, we'll often see the leafy gametophyte. And sometimes we'll see a spore-producing stage called the sporophyte. So we're going to go on some excursions and keep our eyes open for sporophytes and gametophytes. Let's go. This is a dry open site, the kind of place that I like to call a glade or barren. It's a place where the soil is so thin and dry, and there's so few nutrients that not many plants can grow here. Not many trees, not many shrubs. But a kind of plant that does really well here is a moss. 
mosses are able to grow where hardly any other plants can grow because, well, they can turn on and off. When it gets dry, they just, they're dormant and it doesn't hurt them. And when it's moist, they can grow just fine. And they're able to grow really slowly because nothing else is competing with them and trying to live in the same places. So let's take a close look at some of the mosses that are growing here on this glade. These are the gametophytes of Polytricum moss. Sometimes you'll see gametophytes without sporophytes attached, but let's go look for some gametophytes that do have sporophytes attached. Haircat moss. The moss Polytricum, it's called haircat moss. And here you can see why. The spore case, it has a cap on it, and this cap has a lot of hairs on it. In fact, the name Polytricum, if you say it polytricum, poly means many, tricum means hairs, its cap has many hairs. Here are two mosses growing side by side with really different growth forms. The one on sort of the left that looks like a tree, that's an aquacarp. It grows up and has sporophytes when they have sporophytes at the top. The one on the right, it's more of a branched thing, kind of like a carpeting moss. It's called a pleurocarp. And when it has sporophytes, they're kind of in the branches. One of the fun things about looking at mosses is, well, they're small, which means that in order to see them really well, you have to use something that has a lens. I love things that have lenses. I love binoculars, I love telescopes, I love microscopes, I love cameras. And one of my favorite things is this little hand lens. It's called a loop. It magnifies things, that's L-O-U-P-E. It magnifies things 10 times. And it's kind of like having a microscope around your neck. Botanists have these loops, kind of the same way that binoculars always have binoculars, always have bird watchers, you know what I mean. Um, and but the way to use it is to hold it really close to the specimen and ooh, long narrow leaves. I see some teeth on the leaves. I see these ribbons of cells along the top. I do believe this is Atricum angustatum. Well, this moss is called Atricum. Atricum means no hairs. Why is it called that? Well, because it's very closely related to Polytricum, which has many hairs. So I guess the fact this moss, instead of having hairs on its little cap, the way hair cap moss does, it doesn't have any. So it should be called, I don't know, unhair cap moss? Bald cap moss? I don't know. Anyway, it's growing here on this sandstone ledge in a really shady place where almost nothing else can grow. The leaves have these ribbons of cells along the top of it. it gives them extra surface area for so photosynthesis. Here's a picture through the microscope of this atricum leaf, and it shows these ribbons of cells, these lamellae, these like walls of cells all along the midrib on the top. It probably increases photosynthesis, maybe absorbs moisture, and it sure makes it easy to identify. It's really pretty. And here's a picture from about 15 years ago, taken in an open area. It's the same species, and look, you can see the leafy gametophyte in the bottom and some upright sporophytes, and notice they have that tip that has a cap on it, but no hairs. Atricum, no hairs. Hey, Bob, wake up. It's time for another video. Oh, this is the one about logs, right? Logs. Logs are great places for mosses to grow. One of the substrates in a forest that doesn't last very long and so isn't a place where you're going to find shrubs or trees growing are logs. As soon as a tree falls, the first things that are found on them are mosses. These aren't typically the kinds of mosses that are adapted for drying out. These are ones that are moist most of the time because, well, a forest environment like this, it's shady, the soil is kind of damp, and what they actually do is they keep the log moist and those are good conditions for fungi to decay the wood. So the mosses help the recycling process. Here's a moss that looks like a fern. When I was just starting college, I had a book on the plants of the northeastern United States, and it had ferns in it. And I looked and looked and looked and looked to try to find what, it, what this fern was. And I finally took it to my teacher, and he said, nope, it's not a fern, it's a moss. It's called Thuidium delicatulum sometimes called common fern moss. And you can see it's kind of like a fern. It's branched and branched again, kind of lacy looking. It's very common on logs and one of the more easily identified mosses. What about bare rock, like boulders in the woods? Do mosses grow on those? Well, yeah, indeed they do. Funny you should ask. We have one right here. 
Let's take a look at this moss growing on this bare rock boulder. This is Hedwigia ciliata, a very characteristic moss of the tops of boulders. It's really remarkable for how different it looks when it's wet versus when it's dry. Now it's dry. It looks very gray, kind of steely. It's got um, a little clear area without any green in the tips of the leaves, so when they're dry it looks gives it sort of a whitish appearance. Hedwigia ciliata. Well, here's a challenging place to grow. High on the bark of a tree. Kind of dry, not a lot of nutrients, exposed to wind. Who can grow there? A moss. Let's take a close look at the moss that's able to grow this high on the tree. So here, high on the bark of this tree, is a moss with sort of flattened branches and they're curled up a little bit. It's got kind of a light color. I'm pretty sure this is called Anamadon Minor. Well, here I am in a little wetland area, sort of a pocket of water between a, a road and a, a ridge in the forest that's uh, got an unusual moss growing here. It's called sphagnum moss. It's a moss that grows in nutrient-poor areas, which is another advantage that mosses have over higher plants, is that they can tolerate low nutrients. So I want to show you this sphagnum moss, but um, I have to mention, it's so annoying. Somebody has their drone here. You know how people have drones? They always think they're so cool with their drones and showing it off and having it show up in places where, oh my God, it's attacking me. Ah, 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 I'll get you, I'll get you. Come on, drone. Well, I'm glad we got that out of the way. Let me show you the moss. <laughs> well, as you may have guessed, that was my drone. And this is a low-lying area with some unusual kind of hydrology. It's kind of shallow soil. It's persistently wet. It's kind of gravelly. I think it has some sort of limestone influence. There's this sort of pebbly material that forms the banks of this. And there's a lot of unusual wetland plants, scattered shrubs, and here's me pointing out the sphagnum moss, picking up a piece, saying, this is sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss. They have a real distinctive architecture. They have a main stem, kind of like a trunk, and then branches coming off the sides. But at the top, a lot of branches are clustered together into like a, a head, like a pom-pom. It's called a capitulum. And sphagnum moss is able to absorb a lot of water. You might have heard of it as something that's used in gardens to, as an amendment to the soil to improve the water holding capacity. So a peek through the microscope will show the basis for this immense water holding capacity of sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss. There's two types of cells here. Those ones that form the border, the long narrow ones, those are green photosynthetic cells. They're alive at maturity. But those big spaces in between, those are hollow dead empty cells with holes in them and they can absorb water. That's why sphagnum moss can absorb up to 25 times its weight in water. Here's a dry spot on the ground where some time ago, maybe last year, there's obviously a campfire, because you can see some charred wood. And growing among the charred wood is a moss that's sometimes called fire moss. Let's take a close look at this moss. It's called Funeria hygrometrica. And the name hygrometrica means water measuring. And the reason it's called that is the sita. The stalk that supports these unusual shaped sporangia, they're bent and curved, and as the atmospheric humidity changes, they bend and twist. Not really fast, but enough to change the orientation of these sporangia to help distribute the spores. Well, thank you for coming on the moss excursion. And if you're interested in mosses, keep in mind that starting out, you don't need microscopes. You can do really well with just a 10x loop like this and that mosses grow everywhere. 
If you have any questions about mosses or any other botany topics, the people at the Museum of Biological Diversity's Herbarium would be happy to help. So have fun out there studying nature, and thanks again for watching. Thanks for watching. If you're still curious about moss, you can check out the books provided by the Grandview Heights Public Library in the description below this video. If you liked this video, press the thumbs up and share it with your friends. You can also subscribe and get notifications every time there is a new Spectacular Specimens video. Be sure to join us next week as we explore the animals that live in Ohio's rivers and streams.